And don't take my word, go and check the evidence. Don't take my that's how I know Oliver North. Because I was called in by my friends at the UN about this whole grenade invasion thing. And I was the person who had the credibility enough for them to send to speak to Eugenia Charles and this Siaga guy. We spell his name C-I-A-G-A. Obviously. <laughs> you know who Siaga is? Educated in Jamaica, went to Harvard and wrote a treatise on cultism. That's, a, that's the name of the treatise, cultism. <coughs> he was the guy who went back and created Heritage Day in Jamaica and drank a pint of goat's blood. It was in the papers. He drank that. Our heritage. He's a mixture of Lebanese, European, and black. That's his uh, ethnicity. He was the guy, not Manly, and Manly's an ass already. He was the guy that promoted Bob Marley. See how he did that. Now Reagan says, we have a friend in Jamaica. Some guy, I'm making a speech down at the Information Service, USIA, and the guy gets up and asks the question, some Republican type. Uh, we have friends in the third world. Fuck that. It's not who are the friends of the president. Who are the friends of the American system. The fact that you could... These guys are really stupid. I know that all these stupid ex-blacks and indentured labor and Reagan tells them <laughs> you must believe in the magic of the marketplace. You ever heard of it? <laughs> and their ancestors came here because of the lack of magic in the marketplace. <laughs> 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 I thought that was black. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so, well I, I've made this digression. Voodoo, that's, true. that's it. <laughs> you do what voodoo. No? <laughs> <laughs> that's the <laughs> I, I, I make that digression because I want to tell you this. I've been saying this since my illness and I came back September 85. No? You guys don't know what reality is in politics. You guys don't know how the world is shaped. You still hear crap. Iran will do this. Iraq will do that. France will. Nation states don't run the world. It's the people behind the, the leaders in the nation states that run the world. Iraq doesn't do anything. Iran doesn't do anything. The Lebanese don't leak a story. The Soviets get their friends to leak the story that America is doing that as part of global... Look, the man is winning. <coughs> That's what we're trying to hide. This, this guy's going to ask, you, 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 you believe that crap about Danilov and Sukarov and all that crap is going on? The guy's an imbecile what we have there now. And when you make a noise about it, nobody listens, so I keep quiet because the next thing, I, I'm running out of countries. <laughs> That's why we're going to colonize Mars. I have, no <laughs> I have no other place to go. <laughs> because the next place I have to go is the place to which I suppose, suppose Hulon has gone. And so that I have to watch what I see. But that's what I just have. That's the meaning of power play. Understand power plays. Bush, watch what he's going to do. It's going to be a power play. Watch what Dawn is going to do. It's going to be a power play. Watch what Gary Hart is going to do. What is the best strategy I must use to take advantage of the moral vacuum created by the <coughs> emperor losing his clothes? That's what he's going to do. <laughs> That's what he's going to do. That's what life is about. That's those are the power plays involved. And that's what Shakespeare educates you in, if you would look. I know we waste time by merely repeating the lines full stop. The man's job is hypothesis formation, to encourage you <coughs> to form hypotheses about history and about life. You know what happened when they reproduced Coriolanus in Paris after the war? They were riots. Rats and pies, this whole business of the man and horse back and this, that, and that. So, he has shallow and justice up for jokes, hmm? and he has the sheriff's men, who the borderers, they call it. 
their up the jokes too. Now, the king now is in Westminster and he's going to die. Famous passage uh, that you must know about, you must have heard the expression, uneasy lies the head that wears the crown, is from this part too. Uh, Henry the Now, while she's there, his sons are inside, and he's lying on the bed and the, the crown is put next to him on the pillow. They go outside and tell the eldest son, Henry V, Prince Hal, to go in. He thinks his father is dead. He makes a speech about it, uh, you know, how death is a few minutes away, etc. Life is shallow, short, that, that, and the crown. And he takes <coughs> the crown and goes in the next room and tries it on. But the man's in a coma, he's dead. So he wakes up. Who has the crown? <laughs> you check it out, Henry, your son. You mean you wouldn't even wait until I die? You know? Big scene in Henry gives you a lesson in diplomacy, how to explain away that. I, I did do it, don't lie, you know? But I thought you were dead and I honestly, I wasn't trying it on for ambition, blah, blah. Important point. Empiricism is a bad tool of truth. The crown is missing, Henry got it in his head. Inference, he's trying to become king before his father's death. This is a stupid empirical conclusion. That's why he put it in the play. He didn't put it in the play so the groundlings in the pit could laugh. He's putting it there saying, look, empiricism is not the sole source of truth. It is not the sole tool of truth. And if you rely on empirical methods alone, you get nowhere. I remember when the Watergate crisis was going on. Fellows asked me, a Mexican friend of mine who never lost his job because he both voted uh, the wrong way in Zionism and the rest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he lost his job. I survived. <laughs> Zionism was a form of racism. We both voted that way. Right. He was a foreign minister of uh, the Rosa or something like that. Ah, right. Anyway, the question was, did Nixon know beforehand that you guys were going to burglarize Watergate? In the same way, you've got to be real asses to believe it, that Reagan didn't know beforehand what Moss was doing. He was so interested in Tantra, anything he doesn't know? He's kidding. But, Jay, no proof, huh? An empirical proof. But they asked me this stupid question. Did Nixon know beforehand that his guys were going to think about And, uh, I use the old method, which the Buddhists like, you know, to ask back a question. So I ask them, who ever heard that the madam of a whole house is a virgin? <laughs> <laughs> now you get the point? <laughs> Do you want empirical proof that the madam of a whole house is not a virgin? <laughs> to believe she is not a virgin? You see? Well, Nixon's White House was a whole house. It was. I mean, Ehrlichman and Haldeman and Kissinger. And, you know? Why you guys insist on empiricism? I don't know. It's, mis it's, it's always exposed fact. You have to wait for the data. You know? And then draw an inference and a generalization. Until you get the data, you have no knowledge. That's what it means. So it starts off on a faulty basis. It could corroborate things. Above all, you mean to tell me that you guys to this day live in a society which still accepts if you watch the scientific programs as I watch, that an apple could attract the whole earth? An apple on a tree. The man says the earth attracts the apple. And the apple, this little pop up apple, they attract the whole earth. Are <laughs> <laughs> you believe this? <laughs> you know? The law of attraction. Action at the distance. Gravitational pull and all that crap. So look to understand what a power play is. Now the king now, after this passage where Henry tries on the crown and explain and Shakespeare makes his point, the king dies. And Henry V is going to succeed in Britain. They're not fools. The oligarchy and foolish. They choose Aristotelianism. It isn't that they don't know Platonism. <coughs> don't make that mean. They know what the alternative is. 
because it was they who deployed their car and fooled everybody. If you really study what happened to Leibniz and those guys, you'd be amazed. They, they felt because Descartes started to argue against Newton, <coughs> action at a distance is wrong, you know. Therefore, he got to be a good guy, you know, because you don't believe in action. You look out many people in this organization, some ask out there, says one thing that we believe in. One, he's a great guy. Oh, he's a cannibal, he's a whole man with it, but he says <laughs> one good thing. <laughs> he's a great guy. You know, what's for that? You have to get into why he does what he does. Causation. That's what this man's message is. Get causation at all times. Why does he do what he does? You know, don't worry, I'm from in Latin America. You know this. You want American aid? Make, you have to make a big speech cussing communism. Simple. <laughs> and I was set up once by the Prime Minister. Look, Freddie, we need American aid. I said, yes, I know. He said, well, you got to make a speech. I'm tired of making it. <laughs> so, uh, what you want me to do? He said, I'll be holding a big rally, make a speech, and cross the communists. And so I said, fine. <laughs> <laughs> and I used the Bible, and I cross those communists. <laughs> you know? Cross them. And I had, a, I had a crowd in stitches. I said, the Soviets come and tell you so, but that's a red herring. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> like that. Next morning, the American ambassador sought an interview. <coughs> said, I sent uh, the text of your speech <laughs> yeah, down to the State Department and I sent the copies to be circulated, the defense and all that, you know, so. and um, I said, well, you know, that's what I feel, the Prime Minister asked me to make it. He says, uh, I can't promise you anything in the specific, but I must let you know, according to a cryptic message I had by code, which we had, we had their code, but we <laughs> <they're stupid. laughs> They, they only look at the codes when they're in the big countries, you know, like France, Britain, Russia. When you're in a small country, you don't think you need to keep any serious code. So we had their codes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we'll increase the level of AIDS. Uh, some things in the pipeline will be continued because of this. And it did. It was very true. You cross the comments. And then when now, the Russians, you need them for any purpose, to buy bauxite, for instance. You don't set me up because i got to keep a credibility going. You said somebody else not to cost the capitalists, you see. <laughs> and he cost his capitalism. And the Russians, yes, bravo. 1917, October, and all that. And they buy the bauxite. So the English tight rope, though. Tell you that, that much. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> you have to always ask why. You have to always inquire why things are as they are. I was telling you once in a lecture that there are three platonic questions that every Platonist asks himself. I might as well tell them tonight. The first question is, why are things as they are and not otherwise? That is the first question. Second question is, what assumption have I overlooked in making my initial hypothesis? And the third question is, what is that without which all falls down? Those are the three questions that give you platonic answers. You don't have to go and smell a piece of oil, or wait for a case study, or go asking, you know, people. Those are the platonic questions. You know what sent Newton mad? That a young Platonist of his day asked him, why do all the planets orbit the sun in the same direction. And so fine, he, he, he agreed with Kepler, and, he, <coughs> and incidentally, I can tell you how he did it. He worked the mathematics back to see what assumption he has to make, made the assumption, and worked forward. So, right. But oh, so it's elliptical orbit, you know, eccentricity, and so forth. And elliptical orbits around the sun. So the guy asked him, all right, fine. But why did they go in the same direction? <laughs> Uh, it's not one, not that they all go that way. I mean, they come so and they come so, but it's all say yes, say clockwise for now. That's because that mean, has no meaning, really. But they go in one direction. Why? Then another guy asked him, "But is the sun really static, or does it move?" Because we heard you give a lecture where you said the sun revolves on its axis and moves towards Hyperion, star Hyperion. It does. 
So the sun isn't really static. All is motion, said Heraclitus. And while you're going through all this mathematics, if Heraclitus was right, you know, just say Heraclitus, all is motion. And what's a comet? You know, you know, you know up to this day in 1986, you guys are supposed to believe that comets come from some extraterrestrial place, hmm? and suddenly appear with a big tail and a dirty snowball, eh? <laughs> and then some say, oh, but the orbit of a uh, comet, check it out, don't take my word, is either parabola or hyperbola or ellipse. But you know what a hyperbola is? How the hell could you have a hyperbolic path? It's two things going so. But it is here, so. And a par parabola is this, you know, it's just good enough. But suppose everything is rotation. Suppose everything is circular. Just uh, let us do some hypothesis formation as an example of what I mean. Suppose you take, you know what an ellipse is, your mouth is an ellipse, okay? And you make a long ellipse and bring it around rotationally, right? If you're standing here, you'll see a hyperbola. If you're standing over here, you'll see a parabola. You see what I mean? So, formation, the kind of curve, has to be related to directionality and locus where you are at the time you're making the observation. So, a guy would say it's a hyperbola. What you, when all he's really saying is that all action, which is true, is rotational. You don't walk a straight line. You walk part of a curve. Now, we've done all that talking here. We have a case study. We don't, have, we don't have any spectroscopes hmm? and, fi and, and fine constants. You know that thing they, they, they give you? Hmm? Suppose, suppose all the planets, this is a hypothesis I'm offering you, it's one of mine, but no one accepts it because I have to write something called the conceptualization of change. Suppose that all the planets go in the same direction because the solar system itself has a nucleus, a sun elsewhere. You know, it's revolving around something. You can't prove I'm wrong. It's a hypothesis. It surely explains the fact that they go in the same direction. Because just as we go around the sun, the whole time we came off of the sun, the sun created all these planets. The envelope of gas and expanding, you read Leibniz and Tartan. And contaminate, and uh, we solidified and condensed and formed planets. Okay, but when the sun was there, suppose the sun itself was a planet of something else. Would not explain why the sun does all this, and we do it. It's a hypothesis. But then I'm merely a little insignificant black chap from Guyana here. Don't take my word for it. It's a hypothesis. The point I'm making is that empiricism is a bad tool of truth. And if you get married, for Christ's sake, don't depend on empiricism. <laughs> Otherwise, when your husband plays the football <coughs> game and forgets his shorts, you will say, well, what the hell, you left your shorts, etc. Which has happened to a friend of mine, you know. Difficult to explain in court. <laughs> <laughs> so he uses, he uses uh, Paul stuff and these guys for this. Well, the king dies and the the point I was making is that the oligarchy believes in a bit of Platonism. Platonism. They know. They prefer because they run the world on Aristotelian. And sometimes they have to accept Platonism to go to the next stage. So when they say the king is dead, long live the king. That's what they say. If Elizabeth dies, a guy will come out to announce the problem. The queen is dead, long live the king. That's what he has to say. It means that to rule is a process of continuity, you know? Henry V becomes the king immediately. There is no gap, there is no hiatus. At the moment he is dead, he is the king. So he becomes the king and everybody expects now that he is going to, now he has power. He is going to do things. Well, I cannot let, get, let you into the secrets of what he will do until I get to Henry V. I will merely tell you this. And once he had slapped the chief justice, and the chief justice had jailed him, 
So he became King of Egypt. Justice was quivering. Man is now king. You know? So he said, uh, I know, uh, let me beg your pardon. I, I know I jailed you when you slapped me, but he said, I want you to achieve justice because that's right. I was wrong and you were right. Shakespeare is building up the ideal philosopher king type, you see. And Pistol carries the news back to Falstaff. Hi, right, boys, uh, Prince Hal is now the king. Great days. <laughs> Great days. Falstaff now. He can stop drinking ale now. He's okay. No, no, no. That's <laughs> horrible. <laughs> <Kevin>. yeah, <right. laughs> no, you know what he does? He rejects them, he jails them. And in Henry V itself, Paul Stapp dies of the rejection. He says, No, I am king. Those days are over. The lesson I gathered from those days is this that a, a, a prince should <laughs> always know how his people think. Because you cannot, I use my words now. You cannot lead people from in front, but be so far in front they can't see you. You know? That identified. So he says, the hell with you guys. Don't come and stay 10 miles away from me. Or else, you know, I thought I couldn't, blah, blah. And he invents other comic characters for Henry V, but Paul Staff has had it. And pistol, and a lot of puns on pistol. And Pistols, cock is up and flashing fire will follow and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he shows the disorder, the chaos, and the ruin that needs must follow all attempts to abandon natural law. The law, the conscription, the battles, the rain was inconsistent with natural law. It was not calculated to promote the creation of processes, their growth, and above all, their development. It wasn't. You can't have a continuous fight against rebels going on. You can't have statecraft being reduced to who shall reign next. <laughs> you have to do some things while you wait around for who shall reign next. You can't have it that way. Hence the disorder, the chaos. And out of this, brings out this Prince Henry V, not to say he was ideal in the sense that he was a great man. Some of his qualities are going to be great, but he's going to use him as a sounding board. When he's wrong, why he's wrong. When he's right, why he's right. And Henry will come out and make all these speeches. And he will have some fantastic statements that are really kind of saying, he's a sudden scholar. Well, isn't that what happens? I've met people in this movement <coughs> who just joined the movement they learn a few of our hypotheses, and when they come to me, their parents are complaining. He's a certain scholar. He's telling you about Plato and Aristotle. Before that was Duke Ellington and Count Basie. You know? Certain <coughs> scholar. But that's, that's what it's about. So it's an important play for you to look at. And it's important in the context of power players, important as a build-up towards Henry V, the next play, and one of the crucial battles of the world, Argyancourt. It's important, there's a lot of poetry in the play. I gave you one passage already, and there are other passages with the which I shall not deal. Uh, soliloquies by the king, the difficulties of leadership. What is leadership? Above all, right through the thing, the important things are not the rights of the leaders, the duties of the leaders. Because according to Shakespeare, right and duties are correlatives. Right is the heads of the coin and duties of the tail. You have a right to personal safety because I and others have a duty not to hit you. That's the only sense in which the word right should be used. And you shouldn't speak about a president's rights or privilege or congressman. His duties are what's important. Existence is defined by duties and duties are further defined by adherence to natural law. So when you get up in the morning, cut the crap. What are my rights today? That's shit. What are your duties? That's what's important. This crap out there, you've been in California, I was there in 76. I have a right to use my body as I choose. Crap! You have a duty not to abuse the body. Love? 
it, it is false Benthamism and a false John Dewey and those guys push the creed of liberalism beyond its, beyond its natural meaning. It's your duties that are important. You have a duty to the country, to mankind, to civilization, to science. He's going to say in Henry V, without science, man is a savage. That's what the man says. Actual words of Shakespeare. So duties are what's important. And uh, next time I'm here, I'll do Henry V. But let me at least suffer the delusion that you will have read Henry I, Henry IV, part one, and part two. Because I can't stop. I have to go because I'm, I'm ordered to get you guys into Plato's dialogues. That's what I'm getting at, you see? And, uh, I got it from two sources. A derived source in Dennis Speed and an original source in LaRouche. Hurry up that Shakespeare and get those guys into a flip and the dialogues and what happened. So you help me because uh, I cannot wait.